South Africa's top court rules Zuma not eligible for presidential election. Zuma, who left office in 2018, dogged by corruption allegations, uh, was convicted of contempt of court during a case in 2021 and sentenced to 15 months. Well, joining me on the program at this time is Asanda Ngoshiang, a political activist and analyst from Cape Town, and also Terry Nselani is a former chairman of the Electoral Commission of South Africa's uh, election. That's uh, from Johannesburg. Thank you for joining me. Thank you very much for having me. All right, Terry. Uh, I mean, let me start off with your immediate um, reaction to Jacob Zuma being um, well, considered not eligible to run in this polls. Um, do you think that is uh, fair enough? And um, let's also consider the implication of this particular move on the election itself. Well, the Constitutional Court is the court of last instance in South Africa. And therefore, uh, its ruling is binding in all of us uh, as citizens of the country. So, uh, Mr. Zuma, together with MK Party, are also bound by the decision of the Constitutional Court. Uh, there may be people who may not be happy with uh, the decision, uh, but at the end of the day, it is the final, uh, it's a court of the final instance. And however, uh, because Mr. Zuma is actually a leader of the MK party and uh, he is on the ballot, uh, the effect of his candidacy was not going to have any effect in any case. Uh, on the ballot paper and preparations for the elections. It was just his candidacy that was being uh, contested. And then the court has ruled that he can't be a member of parliament as a result of it. Hmm. Now, there are fears that uh, this particular decision, particularly for Zuma supporters, uh, will stoke fears of violence and unrest in the run-up to this uh, election, which of course is just a few days away, uh, already the most competitive since the advent of uh, pre that post apartheid democracy in 1994. Do you think that um, this particular decision by the court uh, would uh, stoke uh, some level of, uh, will I call it fear, of violence? I really don't think so. Um, of course, the law enforcement agencies have got to be. Uh, prepared for any eventuality. Uh, but um, I think uh, the leadership of South African political parties uh, is uh, of matured people, and I don't think they will want to plunge the country into a crisis. And I don't think that uh, even MK Party and Mr. Zuma would want to do that. Mr. Zuma was at the helm of uh, the country, and I don't think he it would be in his interest uh, that uh, he does anything that is going to make it impossible for us to be able to go uh, to the polls. Uh, the opinion polls thus far uh, give uh, MK Party and his party, uh, put put the MK Party in a favorable position in terms of the number of votes that it can garner. And I'm not too sure, or I don't think that uh, he would want to jeopardize that by uh, urging his supporters to engage in something that is firstly unlawful and secondly that is going to uh, disrupt the electoral processes uh, because at the end of the day then it would mean that he is not able to uh, gauge his level of support and get his people to be in parliament. Mm. Now you were the former chairman of the electoral commission you know of South Africa can you just uh, take us through how this process actually works uh, for a party to be considered eligible, a candidate to be considered eligible, what are those uh, uh, steps that must be fulfilled, crucial steps to ensure that uh, at the end of the day, you stand worthy to run for office? Well, there are quite a number of processes. Firstly, you've got to be a registered party. And a registered party goes through a particular process, including having to uh, advertise its intention to be registered in a government gazette for a particular period. And after having gone through that, and then once the commission has recognized that 
and it has submitted a number of signatures of people who support it, as well as its constitution. Um, then that party gets registered. After that, then it becomes eligibility to participate in the electoral process, and then that would entail having to submit list of candidates, have got to submit a declaration indicating that all members are bound by the code of conduct, um, and then, and then uh, also the eligibility to stand in an election uh, is one of the conditions. So in this case, uh, Mr. Zuma, because uh, there was a case where he refused to appear before the, constitu- the, the, uh, the commission of inquiry, uh, he was uh, criminally charged and the constitutional court found him guilty. Uh, of an offence and a sentence him uh, to about 15 months. And the Constitutional Court today ruled that that on its own uh, renders him ineligible uh, to be a member of the National Assembly. Mm. Now, uh, I mean, still, you know, in your uh, former capacity as uh, the chairman of the Electoral Commission, this particular election, according to many, uh, seems to be a tight race in what well, I call it uh, the th- almost uh, 30 years of uh, democracy in South Africa. Do you think this would uh, uh, put some sort of pressure on the commission to uh, deliver in terms of uh, the, the, the elections? Is there any pressure, do you, I mean, as a former chairman on the commission at this time? Of course, uh, there is always pressure on the electoral officials and that pressure gets even worse during the time of the elections. Uh, And it doesn't really matter where you are, whether you're in South Africa, you're in Nigeria, or in Ghana, or any of the countries. For as long as you are managing the elections, there is always pressure on you uh, to uh, deliver the elections, but also pressure from political parties, because political parties expect uh, certain things uh, from the officials of the commission in order uh, to have a favorable deal uh, going into the elections. You know, so South Africa is no different in that case. Uh, But uh, what makes South Africa even more interesting this year is the fact that uh, we no longer really have one dominant political party. Uh, The days when you have one dominant political party are over. And you can see this in terms of the last elections in 2021, where in all the metropolitan councils in South Africa, you now have got coalitions, which shows that there is no one dominant political party in those metropolitan areas. And these are populous areas. And now everybody is beginning to think that it is possible that even at the national level, you will not actually have one dominant political party and that any person can actually be a kingmaker in the process. So the pressures on the commission are extremely high and intense uh, as a result of uh, this factor, you know, so um, we will see how the commission will manage all these issues, uh, but the pressures is something that we cannot actually discount. Mm. Now, according to some members of the MK party, in their words, they say they are very disappointed that this uh, is an agenda, and of course, to delay the liberation of black people in this country. Now, this, of course, are words of uh, Lin Diwe. That's an MK party member. And some of them are even of the opinion that uh, this was done in cohort with the government, talking about uh, the ruling party, the ANC, the judiciary, and the commission. Uh, Do you think that is? Well, I don't think the commission would have been party to a conversation of that uh, matter. But uh, you must remember that also for political parties, when they don't get their way, um, they will want to interpret the decisions that do not go their way in a particular manner. Uh, so I would interpret this uh, to be someone who is not happy with the decision of the Constitutional Court. Uh, but, uh, you know, in the absence of evidence of the things that uh, the person is saying, uh, I would say um, I don't think there is anything untoward. The Constitutional Court in South Africa is very independent constituted by astute lawyers and people of integrity. And I don't think they would, um, you know, sit with 
uh, some government officials uh, to try to plan uh, to disadvantage any of the political parties. All right. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Terry. Let me bring in Asanda uh, into the conversation. She joins me now. Asanda, thank you for joining me on the conversation. Well, let me take your immediate reaction to uh, the, the former president, Jacob Zuma, being, uh, according to uh, the court ruling, branded not eligible to run in this election. Do you think this will have any adverse effect or any impact on the quality of uh, the polls just around the corner? I don't think it's going to have any effect on the equality because this is something that we expected. I have already said multiple times that I think the Constitutional Court is going to rule that he is ineligible because if you understand the constitutional laws around who actually can, in terms of criteria, become a member of parliament and who can become uh, you know, a president candidate, it was very clear from the beginning that Jacob Zuma did not meet those because of the charges that he had received and the fact that he had spent time in jail for those charges. And so it wasn't a surprise to those of us who read and understand the law and read and understand the political system and how it works. It's just that, unfortunately, many South Africans don't quite understand the minutiae detail of how the systems work and how the laws work. And so this is where people like Jacob Zuma take advantage and, you know, obfuscate things so that it looks like he is the victim because that is exactly the kind of politics that he likes to play. He likes being someone who's seen to be a victim of the system, even as he is actually part of power and has been a cabinet member and part of the executive since 1994. He has never been an ordinary member of society, but he constantly paints himself as an outsider, constantly paints himself as somebody who's outside of the system while actually in the system and benefiting from the system, including having been the president, which is literally the top position that is possible in politics in South Africa or anywhere in the world for that matter. I mean, you, you said quite a number of things concerning the person of Jacob Zuma. But uh, let's also look at the fact that uh, you said that uh, quite a number of people don't read between the fine lines of the Constitution. How do you think uh, communication can be broken down such that people are able to understand that, look, uh, this has nothing to do with this person, but this is what the law says. For that reason, please be orderly, because there are affairs that this move, you know, is considered a political witch hunt and maybe my stock violence. Well, I mean, I think, you know, we're already hearing the, the, the MK itself starting to do some of this communication to say that while they don't necessarily agree, they don't expect unrest. And the political system itself, the security cluster, has already come out to say they are prepared for any potential unrest or violence. And of course, South Africa is a country that has got contestations and every election, there's either a protest or some kind of threat of unrest. And so this is nothing new um, to anybody that's in South Africa. And in fact, I think across the, con the African continent, the contestation for power and access to resources is always something that is going to lead to potential threats of violence and unrest when certain people don't get their way. I'm still going to stay with you, Sander. Now, let's also look at uh, the, this particular election. I mean, in 30 years of South Africa's uh, democracy, this election, according to many, is seen as uh, an election perceived to be a tight fist, a tight race, uh, given the fact that the ANC, that's the ruling party, you know, has been enmeshed in quite a number of scandals too, and has uh, fallen off what I call it the good books of quite a number of people. Do you still see that happening with uh, Zuma out of the race? Well, I think that, you know, Zuma, I wouldn't put Zuma out of the race quite yet. So it's South Africa, our system is at this point half, you know, political party and half individual candidate. And so we don't vote for a president as, a, you know, in an individual presidential election like other countries. We vote for a political party, which then puts forward its ultimate candidate, who then gets appointed by the parliament. And of course, if the political party has enough of a majority, they then choose the president. And so Jacob Zuma can continue to be a person who leads the MK and can, you know, appoint then a person who's going 
going to be the president that will represent the MK at, you know, a parliament and at events where the MK needs to be represented. But it doesn't mean he's out of political influence and out of the race, as it were. He just cannot be a presidential candidate and he cannot be a member of parliament. And so he cannot actively participate in lawmaking, but he can certainly and certainly will influence. But I want to also offer that Jacob Zuma was never likely to be a member of parliament for one fact, which is that he still receives benefits as a former president of South Africa. And in order for him to continue to receive those benefits, he cannot become a ordinary member of parliament because that has lower benefits than the benefits he would get as president. And so I don't think he would have given up his presidential benefits in order to be an ordinary member of parliament anyway. And so this is actually more a case of him wanting to continue to be in the spotlight and him wanting to continue to ensure that the MK gets maximum, you know, public engagement and maximum conversations in the public right up until uh, the, the, the actual election. Because in South Africa, effectively, campaigning time is done and we're winding down in the, in the run-up to the elections at this point. And so this court case is something that gives him, you know, the, the media space as we are sitting having this conversation now and gives, therefore, the MK the media space that it needs in the run-up to the election just to get those kind of last votes in and get those last conversations in. So I don't think he himself is that surprised that the, the ruling has said that he can't be the MP, nor that he actually had any plans to become a, a member of parliament anyway. Okay, Asanda, I would leave you for a moment. Let me go to Terry. Now, because of the peculiarity of this particular election, uh, speculations are also rife that the commission, you know, might be influenced by maybe the, the incumbent party. My question to you is this, how autonomous is the commission itself? Well, the commission is uh, very uh, autonomous and independent and uh, you know, does not account to uh, anybody, any political party other than parliament and the constitution. And um, of course, during periods like this, there will, there will always be pressure on the officials of the commission who are running the elections. Uh, but the commission uh, has got to try by all means to make sure that it does things according to the law. And, and I am confident that there is nothing untoward that the commission can try to do. In any case, even if any individual within the commission were to try to do something, um, it would be very easy to see um, whatever uh, irregularity that is there in the system. And the reason why it would be easy is because the process uh, in South Africa of the elections, it's extremely uh, transparent uh, from the time when you enter the voting station and when the voting station opens, you can, che you can check uh, the ballot box that there's nothing in that ballot box. You can see each and every ballot paper going into a ballot box. And then after that, the ballot boxes and the ballot papers don't leave the voting station. The voting station is turned into a counting center. And then immediately after that, with the presence of observers, in the presence of the observers and party agents, you declare the results, you sign the results, the party agents sign the results, and information is then captured. The results, the results slip is left outside the station for any person to see how people have actually voted in that station. And that information is captured at the municipal office uh, but in addition to that, it is scanned. So you can be able to compare the information that is scanned, which is the result slip itself, with the signatures of party agents, as well as information that has been captured in the system. So there is so much transparency that I don't think anyone would want to risk their reputation by trying to fiddle uh, with the system, because in any case, they'll be found out. All right. I would also like to pose uh, the same question to Asanda. Do you uh, think that the commission has the capacity and uh, also the uh, willpower, political willpower, to deliver, given the peculiarity of this particular election? Yeah, I think they do. I mean, I think now more than ever, the commission has to show that it has the capacity and has to show that it has the neutrality and that it has the mandate more than anything 
to do this kind of work. So, um, you know, one of the, the, the reasons for existence of the IEC is precisely to ensure that democracy is upheld, is precisely to ensure that when things like this happen where people who do not meet the criteria end up somehow on the ballot, that that is corrected. And so they've done the right thing and they continue to do the right thing. And I think the mistake that was made is that in the beginning, people kind of looked at this Mkonto Wesizwe thing as almost like Mkonto Wesizwe versus the ANC in a, in a politics and actually didn't pay enough attention to the fact that this is about South Africa's democracy and the veracity of the democracy. So if you allow Jacob Zuma to break certain laws, you're definitely going to then have to allow everybody to break those laws. And so it was important that, you know, some of the mishaps that had been done were corrected. And I, I think it's important that the Concord has made sure by making the ruling that, you know, the, 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 the mishaps that happened have been corrected. Mm. All right. Uh, thank you so much for your contribution on the show today. Asanda, political analyst from Cape Town, and also Terry Salani, former chairman, the Electoral Commission of South Africa. Once again, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for your